Every time I hear the music, I think anything I do is anticlimactic after that. It builds you up, and then it's just me. It's just the same old, same old, you know. Uh, I have to ask a question. I was scanning the audience a minute ago. Is Alicia and Jay by any chance here? Because they're usually sitting there. Okay, they're not. You, you'll understand why I asked that question a little later in the message. Uh, life is a funny thing. Sometimes we find ourselves, uh, the series has been about people in caves, cave life it's it's typical that you know we're in a struggle of some sort we may feel like we're just hanging on by a thread but sometimes when we're in that place in life suddenly everything shifts around and without us even doing anything or expecting anything we find ourselves in a position of, of power all of a sudden opportunity has just thrown itself in our lap it's kind of like the old saying, sometimes you're the windshield and sometimes you're the bug. Well, this is, this is like where well, you become the windshield all of a sudden overnight. And you have this opportunity to seize control of your circumstances in a way that will be greatly advantageous to you, that will take tremendous worry off of you, tremendous pressure, tension off of you. You'll be able to, to grab hold of some major problems, issues in your life, and just nullify them instantly. And people around you, People around you, godly people, they're telling you, man, this is, this is God's day for you. This is, this is a God-given opportunity. You must seize this thing. You Go for it. Take, take this opportunity for your destiny. And you're already considering taking action because it's very appealing for you on a personal level. It's going to just give you what you've been wanting, maybe secretly been wanting, but you've been wanting something that you didn't have and all of a sudden it's offered right up to you there's just one problem just one your conscience just can't adjust to feeling comfortable with this action that you desire that would solve so many problems as far as your desires your needs in certain ways even though the people of God around you are saying yeah you should do this of course this is given to you by God you need to seize this this opportunity take control of your destiny but somehow your conscience your conscience just can't feel comfortable what would you do what do we do what do you do in a situation like that the opportunity's there. It's such an unusual opportunity. It looks like maybe God engineered it. People around you, God's people, they're saying, yeah, the Lord has certainly engineered this. This is the only way this would happen. These circumstances converging like that, it's got to be God. And yet, as appealing as it is to you, because you know it's gonna, it's gonna give you something you want and it's gonna satisfy some desires you have immediately, your conscience just doesn't feel comfortable. You, you just can't get yourself to feel that, that God's going to feel good about this, as good as the people around you, or maybe as good as you would initially feel if you do it. So, so what do you do? Who, who do you listen to? Uh, do you go to you consult somebody? Do you just say, you know what? These people around me, they're, they're good, they're godly. I'm going to listen to them, even though my conscience is just not feeling comfortable with this. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you we've all done that. I bet you there have been times where inside there was some hesitancy and, and maybe we couldn't even exactly put our finger on it but the thing that we wanted to do we just couldn't feel comfortable doing even though everything was pointing toward doing it and maybe we did it anyway and now we have the, the advantage of history <laughs> you know we can look back now and maybe we're sitting here thinking right now right now where some of us are sitting here thinking Man, I wish I'd have listened to that little voice in my head. It, it was so faint, but it was there, and I remember it was there. There, there was that, just that little bit of hesitancy, and man, I wish, I wish I could have had the self-control to listen to that one, not strong, but it was there, that one little voice, conscience, whatever you want to call it, but we didn't. Now then, there are some of us here that we did. And we denied ourselves some things that were, were offered up to us and that others were saying was legitimate. You should have it. You should do it. It's yours. It's God-given. But we didn't. Our conscience wouldn't allow it to, to go forward comfortably. And we didn't. We denied ourselves. And now we look back and are we glad we didn't? Now, probably we're all over the place in this experience. But we're going to look at a situation like this in Scripture. We're going to look at uh, what I'm going to call the cave of character and compassion. We're going to see both of those things illustrated. Now, the reason I have character first is because compassion comes from character. 
Who, who we are when the lights are out, who we are when nobody's listening, who we are when our minds and our imaginations are free, um, who our deep, what our deepest desires actually are. I mean, lots of these factors tell us who we really are. But it's our character that will determine the degree or, or lack thereof when it comes to compassion. So let's go right straight to Scripture because we have a lot to cover. And we're back to 1 Samuel again, and we're still dealing with David. Last week we dealt with David. Um, David has been anointed by Samuel to be the replacement king of King Saul. King Saul was the first king. He failed to uh, appropriately represent God. He didn't do what God wanted him to do when God wanted him to do it. So Samuel is told, go anoint David. He does, and so now David is technically in God's sight. He is the king, but Saul is the king, politically speaking, in the sight of the people. And so we have this, this tense situation. And David, who was the hero initially, when he kills Goliath, all of a sudden he becomes a threat to Saul. Saul's thinking to himself, this is probably the guy that God's got to replace me and so I'm going to eliminate him and so Saul goes on a tirade for about three years to destroy David because he felt like David was going to take what he had and what he wanted and what he was not going to give away even to God's choice so that's kind of the situation we saw David in a cave last week running for his life his family and a bunch of malcontents <laughs> gathering around him and David was starting actually on a path to destiny it wasn't a path to destruction so we're going to find David again in a cave this is perhaps just a month or so after last week's uh, episode that we looked at so here we go 1 Samuel 24 beginning in verse 1 after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi so Saul took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel and he set out to look for David and his men near the crag David and his men near the crags of the wild goats he came to the sheep's pens along the way and a cave was there there's our cave and Saul went in to yes you're reading it correctly the Bible is a very honest book so Saul had to go to the bathroom in current terminology so he goes into the cave to go to the bathroom David and his men were far back in the cave so Saul's in the cave it's dark he's in there to relieve himself he has no clue that David and his men probably 400 strong at this point they're hiding away in this cave and Saul is in a helpless condition um, I'll just stop there I'll just go on <laughs> the men said this is David's men the men said this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish then David crept up unnoticed and he cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was, what does it say? Keep that in mind. He cuts off the corner of Saul's robe, but his conscience is really bothering him. He, he, he just, there's something about it, he, he just doesn't feel comfortable. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to do what to Saul? Attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Now we're going to pick the text back up in the second point, but we'll leave it here for now. So here's the day. All of a sudden, you know, David's been on the run about a year now. The whole total period he's going to be chased down by Saul is about three, three and a half years but his day has arrived. I mean, he's the windshield. He is not the bug. Saul is in his hands. And you're going to see later on that his men were actually goading him on. They're in the back of the cave, and they're saying, David, this is the day, man. This is the day that God has given your enemy into your hands. Take the initiative. Kill this scoundrel. All this was going on in the dark while Saul was relieving himself. <laughs> now, I'm about to say something, about to tell a tale. This is why I asked earlier if Alicia and Jay were here because this story has uh, a very special meaning to Alicia and Jay. I'm about to tell a story. Some of you perhaps will never want to see me as a person again or never want to see my face again at the end of the story. Some of you, I hope, will be kind and find this humorous because I found it humorous. Two Thursdays ago, I was at the therapist. I know what you're thinking, not this kind of therapist. 
Uh, not that I probably don't need one of these kind of therapists up here, but no, I was at the therapist for my shoulder. I, I had a, a shoulder replacement about three years ago, and I thought I was going to have a bionic shoulder. Instead, I got like an infomercial shoulder, and so, <laughs> so I'm still in a lot of pain. So that's why I'm in the therapist. So uh, I'm at the therapist, and it's Thursday, and Thursday we have Facebook Live, so I'm running out of time, and I know I've got to get back by 1230 because that's when Facebook Live is supposed to start. And... Um, I'm running late and I'm torn because I, like Saul, had to relieve myself. So I'm finished my therapy appointment, so I, I, I get the key to go to the bathroom to relieve myself. Now the key, you have to understand, it is this chain, and I'm not exaggerating, the chain is about this long, and it's big links, these kind of links. It's like something you chain a gate with, and at the end is this tiny little key. So, um, you know, I, I go into the bathroom and I close the door and I, I take this chain with the key and I put it on the back of the toilet tank. Now, what I didn't notice evidently was the degree of angle that toilet tank <laughs> must have had. It looked level to me. <laughs> Nor did I consider the, the friction factor of the chain and the slickness of the top of the tank. At any rate, next thing I know, this chain comes, it looked like a living snake. It started moving <laughs> and, and one link just starts to move down and I'm like kind of watching and paralyzed and I know something bad is happening here and I should do something but I just was paralyzed one chain link hits the water and then it just all starts going and it's like diving intentionally <laughs> deeper and yeah, I'm not kidding you I'm like watching I'm saying no no please stop please stop because it literally went like almost up up in the where it was out of sight completely out of sight oh, man. and now the part that's really gross, it'll make some of you hate me. I'll never go to that church again. Um, let us just say this. It was clear that the toilet had been used a lot that day. I'll just, I'll leave it to your imagination. <laughs> there was evidence it had been used a lot. <laughs> so I'm like, oh man, what am I going to do? I got to get back to Facebook Live. The chain is down almost out of sight. Well, I, I can't, the toilet is so gross. I mean, what would you have done? Well, I had to make a split-second decision. And I went after it. <laughs> well, that was worse because now that I have it dangling in my hand, it's all gross and everything. And I'm like, what the heck am I going to do with this thing? So I took it over to, to the soap dispenser, and I'm like just loading it, covering it with soap, and I'm like lathering it all up and rub-a-dub-dubbing it and putting it under the water, and I'm scrubbing it and scrubbing me. And, and <laughs> then it still had in the bathroom one of those antiquated blowers that blow bacteria you know all over the ones Whoa, when it goes on it'll almost take your skin off so I've got this chain dangling being blown clean <laughs> and so now I had to take it back to the office that's where Jay and Alicia would come in uh, they usually are here and they sit, sit in the front rows but they work at the therapy office and I haven't confessed this sin to them yet so I was gonna I was gonna do it this morning but they're not here so maybe I'll get away with it I don't know <laughs> you guys won't tell will you <laughs> so I did I took it back and I hung it up <laughs> it didn't kill me it won't maybe it won't kill somebody else I figured so, so anyway, I say all that to say, you never know what's going to happen when you go to relieve yourself. <laughs> I'll tell you one more story. This is, this is no kidding. Back when I was in junior high school, some of you are saying, what is junior high school? If you were older, you'd know what it is. Anyway, junior high school is like in my day when you were 12, 12, 13, or 14. Today you call it middle school, but it starts in the sixth grade. Anyway, I was in junior high school. I kid you not. Eighth grade. Um, print shop uh, you're, what is print shop you're saying I, again it's for old people you won't know but I had this class called print shop and so I had to go to the bathroom to relieve myself and as I'm in the bathroom and not trying to be gross again but this was a stand up operation and I feel a hand going into my pocket and I'm like swiping at the hand this, this guy is trying to rob me Kramer Junior High School in Southeast Washington was not the greatest place to be and this guy's trying to rob me while I'm going to the bathroom so so much for bathroom stories. All right, now we get back to the text. <laughs> uh, now, Dal, I'm going to try to get you, I'm going to try to get you back serious again. Now, uh, by the way, whoever has the magic power of the temperature control, uh, could you give me something up here because I'm going to be like a kosher hot dog in a second. It's uh, <laughs> it's unusually hot today. Up here, not not outside. I know. Uh, we want to consider the dynamics of godly character okay David did what he did 
in spite of so much temptation to do the opposite, he had every reason to seize this opportunity and to kill the man who was trying to kill him for no reason. His men, as you'll see later on in the passage, they were encouraging David to do this. He had every reason, but there was something in his conscience that just wouldn't allow him. And he not only restrains himself, but he then rebukes his own men. Because like I say, you'll see later, they had been encouraging him to to kill King Saul. So what was this deal with David? Where did this come from? This kind of self-control. I mean, uh, how do we develop character? What I want to try to show in a very brief period of time you have a character I have a character to this point in our lives we've all developed some character but it's not just a happenstance thing it it happens in a very matter of fact kind of a way and it changes the way we are in here which changes the way we respond to situations and the greatest temptation you're ever going to face in life I want to tell you it's not going to be when things are bad in your life it's not going to be when when you and I are down under and struggling to survive it might feel like that's the greatest temptation but it's not the greatest temptation you and I will face in life is when we're the windshield and not the bug when all of a sudden everything is kind of going our way when we are elevated we are given power we are given an opportunity to control our circumstances in ways that maybe we had not been able to before believe it or not that's the day of great temptation for most of us and I must just share this with you this is by my experience now but a lot of years I've seen more people survive I, I, I'll just throw a ratio out Kim loves this when I give these, uh, these statistics <laughs> for every for every one person that will succeed excuse me for every 10 people that will succeed going through a hard time they'll cling to God and they'll come at it on the other side there'll only be one that will succeed handling a prosperous time a successful time a time when they're the windshield instead of the bug that is a slippery slope and we don't handle power authority opportunity as human beings very well doesn't mean we can't doesn't mean God won't equip us to but but frankly most of us don't handle that very well all right so I want you to consider the dynamics of godly character Uh, godly character doesn't happen by accidents there are pieces there are components there there's there's a, a set of alignments inside of us that allow us to respond to circumstances appropriately when everybody and everything around us is pushing us in a different direction to listen to that still small voice and bring ourselves under control in spite of it all right let me let me take you to scripture the book of James in this passage I'm going to read to you you're going to see both the character of David and the character of Saul the murderous king who is trying to kill David for no reason Beginning in verse 13, we're going to kind of look at David. Now, James is not deliberately talking about them. I'm just saying James, the Spirit of God, speaks to their condition. It says, if you are wise and understand God's ways. By the way, being wise means understanding God's ways. If I don't understand God's ways, it is impossible for me to be wise. I can be smart. I can be intelligent. I can be talented but I will not be wise in the way that God considers wisdom. Wisdom is is not only knowing what is right, it is having the power to do what is right and putting together a life of consistent patterns of doing what God says is right and I'm able to follow up and do it. Anyway, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. David lived with God's wisdom dominating his heart, his mind, his thought process. Now, on the other hand, look at King Saul. Now, this isn't meant to describe King Saul, but I'm just sharing with you, it is a description of what was happening inside King Saul, the dynamics that were controlling his life. But if you are bitterly jealous, Saul was bitterly jealous of David, and there is selfish ambition. King Saul wanted to hold on to the throne of Israel, even though he knew that God had already rejected him from that and taken David to be the king if you're bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying Saul made it out to be like David was out to assassinate him you'll see that later on nothing could have been further from the truth this passage goes on for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom this gives us uh, the red lights on the dashboard if we see jealousy cropping up in our hearts or selfishness no matter what kind of a cool idea we think we have we, that is not God's idea that's not wisdom God's wisdom such things are earthly unspiritual and demonic for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition there you will find disorder and what does it say 
evil of every kind. <laughs> that gets you thinking about every politician, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, let's face it, every politician is, is selfishly ambitious. And this passage is saying, if you find somebody that's selfishly ambitious, they've got lots and lots of secret evil going on in their life. No mystery there. So we, we see both of these internal conditions of character revealed uh, in both Saul and David. Saul is driven by jealousy, driven by selfish ambition. All he cares about is keeping his power, his comfortable lifestyle. David, on the other hand, is driven by something that's completely different. And it's a restraining factor in this particular case that allows him to restrain what would have been very desirable for him, very advantageous, which would have been to take advantage of the opportunity and take Saul's life. Let me share you another scripture with you. It shows the importance of our conscience. 1 Timothy 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, the purpose of my instruction, in other words, the reason, Timothy, that I teach the truth about God and the truth about life, the purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart and a what? Clear conscience and a genuine faith or a genuine trust. Paul, Paul is saying, man, I want you guys to know, first of all, how loved you are, how safe you are with your creator, uh, how for you he is. And, and then he says, when you're filled with that sense of his love, I want you guys to function with a pure heart, to, to not try to manipulate God or manipulate life and, and make it work for you, but just learn to trust God and, and take this gift of life and live it the way he intended you to live it. And then I want you to keep a clear conscience. We're going to see how integral that is. And a genuine trust or a genuine faith, meaning that, man, I just trust God and I do what I do because I trust him more than I trust me. When he says do it, I do it. When he says stop it, I stop it because I trust him once again more than I trust me. But this clear conscience, let me show you one more verse about clear conscience. Again, clinging to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience. He's saying, do this, keep, believers, you that follow Christ, keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their what? Their consciences. In other words, they knew something was not God's will or they suspected something was not God's will or they felt uncomfortable whether it was God's will but they did it anyway maybe they did it because everybody in society was doing it maybe they did it because all their fellow followers of Jesus said you're a fool if you don't take advantage of this might have been a multitude of reasons but they deliberately violated their consciences as a result their faith or their trust has been what does it say shipwrecked what does that mean it means that they're walk their life as a follower of Christ was ruined it means essentially they for the most part stopped following Christ they they just became one that no longer identified as a Christ follower but it all started with just willfully violating their conscience you see inside these things are all connected I'm, I'm going to show you a drawing here in a minute that hopefully will make that a, a little easier to understand so let me go on Here's the picture of what David looked like inside and what a follower of Christ looks like inside. Now again, this is not every aspect of our inner world. I mean, I could have went on and on and on, but I'm just trying to give you something basic so you can understand and I can understand how our character is actually formed and how we're supposed to be functioning from the inside out. So here was David was God-centered. We, we can read the Psalms, most of which were done by David, and we know that way back when he was tending the sheep, he was looking up at the sky and seeing the stars, and he's saying, oh, God, there's nobody like you. You're speaking to us. You're preaching to us from your creation all the time. He's going deep with God. He's looking at creation and tracing it back to the creator and saying, you're brilliant. You're powerful. You're wonderful. You're, you're altogether beautiful because you're more beautiful than the greatest human being, and so therefore you must be this beautiful Christ christ-like version of himself david had a love affair with god his whole life was centered around god from the time he was young scriptures indicate that strongly in a christ follower that same truth should be there that that christ i used to be the center of my life i did what i want when i want how i want it now because i trust christ supremely my life revolves around him i, I want to serve him i want to honor him i want to get closer to him i want to understand him i want to make him known to others that becomes normative so he was God-centered. For us, it's Christ-centered. The next thing was he had a God-enlightened reason where the rest of people were just functioning, you know, based on whatever ideas were prevalent in society at the time. David's 
reasoning faculties which are meant to dominate in you and I our God enlightened reason is meant to be the ruling faculty in us our spiritual faculty um, so that we see life from God's perspective and therefore we respond to circumstances the way God himself would respond we find our value systems being created by this, this God enlightened reasoning faculty this God enlightened reasoning faculty it, it can say no to our desires if we're strong inwardly and healthy so David had a, a, a God-centered life, and a God-enlightened reason, and then a God-calibrated conscience. This is important because I'm going to show you the flip side in a minute. A God-calibrated conscience means that my conscience, your conscience, David's conscience as a follower of God, it's, it's now been attuned. It's been aligned with the will and the word and the ways of God. Now, if I don't know the will and the word and the ways of God, my conscience is not going to be calibrated to God's mind and therefore I will have a faulty guidance mechanism it will mislead me it's just like you know if you have a device that's meant to guide how many have had that happen your your device that's supposed to guide you the talking lady you know in your car I've had that lady talk me into dead end streets and all kinds of things I, I, I've gone and I'm so dumb with directions I'll keep following I'll keep going back around three or four times and I'm thinking, I just know it's going to open up suddenly but it doesn't so if the guidance system is faulty, well, the directions are going to be faulty. Now, you've got this God-centeredness, this God-enlightened reason functioning uh, over you, and then a, a calibrated conscience. A conscience is calibrated to God's word, and then a mind that is functional. Now my mind, my thinking ability, is going to be governed by these, and I'm, I'm going to have a good mind. It's, it's going to do what God intended it to do. In the book of Romans 129, it says some people who have left God out of their life, they have what he calls a reprobate mind, which essentially means a mind that no longer functions the way a mind is supposed to function. So we have a mind that's functional, and then we have our emotional desires that are under the control of our God-enlightened reason, our, calibrate, our God-calibrated conscience, and, and our functional mind. Notice our emotions, our desires. Our desires are not leading. You'll see the, the significance of that in a minute. And then our will. Our will is free. Free to do God's will, free not to do God's will, but I'm free, okay? And our bodies, because we're spirit, soul, and body, the scripture says, we're tripartite. Our bodies are tending toward health, and non-addiction now I'm not saying that we're not going to get sick I'm not saying that we can't be born with some disease or some, some other sort of you know, malady I'm, not saying, I'm just saying the tendency will be that our bodies are moving we're making decisions in life our you know, spirit's making decisions in life that moves our bodies toward health and we tend to be non-addictive or addicted as we're moving with God we're, we're inwardly building character the way that God intends us we're making decisions based on this inner alignment that is God's will for us David had that I mean David only probably had the first five books of the Bible the Pentateuch but nevertheless he had digested internalized it he knew the God behind the word we have to know the word but you've got to meet the God that's behind the word because it's when you meet the God that's behind the word that it has a transforming impact on you and David David had that experience now contrast David with Saul King Saul and we're going to kind of put him as a as a um, as, as a example of those that have not trusted Christ and are not his followers. Here's how they are inside. Instead of being God-centered, they're self-centered. It's all about me. It's what I want. I'm driven by, you know, kind of self-preservation and self-gratification. I want to stay alive as long as I can, and I want to get all the pleasure I can. I'm self-centered. Instead of a God-enlightened reason, I have a societally darkened reason. This is huge. It means that the faculty, the moral faculty, the moral guidance system is fatally flawed. It just picks up signals from whatever is popular, whatever the masses are doing, whatever the, the latest propaganda is, whatever we hear, whatever most people are doing, or they, or everybody's doing it. That fills our reasoning faculty. And then we have a societally corrupted conscience. This is, this is enormous. Folks, we, we, we have... We have a society for the first time in human history, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but the first time in human history, we have a society that is increasingly calling good evil and evil good. And this is being done at, at the, the lowest, most dangerous levels, at, at the levels of our elementary education. Our, our children are being slaughtered before they ever have a chance because they are not being educated anymore. They are being indoctrinated. And I don't mean to lay some heavy burden on parents. I feel bad. My heart breaks for parents of little kids because I'm going to be frank with you your, your options are difficult 
It's like you've got to put them in a Christian school and you've got to f- dig up the money for that or you've got to educate them yourself or you've got to try to bring them through public education and be the most vigilant guardian that the planet has ever seen because you can't escape the technology. Well, well, let me say this. Once you put that phone in that kid's hand, I'm going to be frank with you, you pretty much lost the battle whether you want to accept it or not because you don't have the main body of influence on that kid at that point. That kid's going to learn when, you, when they're not around you, they're going to take in all kind of data from what's on that phone. And they're going, to, they're going to then sit in a school classroom for five, six hours and be indoctrinated, not educated. And then the, the, the rest of the you know, societal intake, whether it's their music or their celebrity fans, it, they're going to be taught around the clock differently than what you and I would want them taught. It's a really difficult task parents have today. Not impossible, but it's difficult. So a societally corrupted conscience emotions and desires instead of the mind being here we are desire controlled the person that's apart from Christ they're controlled by their desires their feelings what they want that's what controls them their mind is dysfunctional it's reprobate like I said Romans 129 their will is enslaved their will does what their emotional desires and even their body desires they don't have control of free will whatever their feelings whatever their desires that's what they're enslaved to and even at times what their body wants. And that's where you get to this. Their body is tending toward being unhealthy and addiction. It is not unusual that a non-Christian, a person apart from God, is addictive. It, it, is, it, is, it is, in my mind, normative. It is unusual if they're not addicted. So, so there's a huge difference. The character on the outside is different because the mechanics, the dynamics on the inside are completely different. Now, I know that's a lot to just digest in one take, so maybe, you know, sometime, if it helps you, look online at the message again and write some notes or whatever. But I was trying to just show you this. The reason that David could make that decision that he made with all the counter pressure, it, it wasn't that he just decided in the moment. Ah, this will help you. Um, how many of you guys are honest enough to admit right now, and you're young and strong, right? I'm, I'm, I'm old and not so strong. You're young and strong. How many of you would admit right now you cannot run a marathon. Can I see your hands? Look at them, a bunch of lame young people. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But there's a reason you can't run a marathon, okay? You you actually could, all of you could. I probably can't just, no, I probably could too. But we can't right now, okay? Because we'd have to put in some months, some of us maybe longer than that, um, (laughs) <laughs> training right right you got to start off you got to run that first mile and you're huffing and puffing and about to blow your lungs out on that first mile but you keep at it every day a little more a little more weeks months years so you get where you're getting up to that 12 miles and you're thinking yeah yeah maybe. so my point is this character the character that we want to see demonstrate itself in the moment David's ability to silence his selfish impulses and silence his men that were encouraging him to to kill Saul it was because his inner inner life his character it had been developing since he was a kid he had been walking with God since he was a kid he was used to listening to God's word and his will he was used to regulating his desires physical desires mental desires emotional he was used to regulating them to God's word it didn't just happen at once he was trained up listen if you and I want to have the godly character we need to make the right call at the pivotal moment we're all going to face pivotal moments they're very tempting then you and I have to be consistent about building godly characters so that we have not this inner setup. If you got this inner setup, you and I, we're, we're going to make bad mistakes, bad decisions. But if we've got the other setup that I showed for David, then, then we have a better chance. But it starts now. It starts every day. It's, it's, it's a training regiment to build godly character. David had done that. So in the critical moment, the pivotal moment, he, he could resist temptation and do what was right in the sight of God, even though it didn't appear to be right necessarily in the sight of anybody else there. All right, let me go back to 1 Samuel now. I'm gonna take you back to the text. 1 Samuel 24, verse nine. He, now the he is David. Remember the scene. Saul's in the cave going to the bathroom. David and his men are hiding in there. They let Saul finish, and he goes outside the cave. Now David shows himself. Mind you, Saul's got 3,000 soldiers with him David shows himself and he talks he said to Saul why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you 
he's talking to Saul now goes on this day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave some urged me to kill you but I spared you so David's men were saying kill this guy I said I will not lay my hand on the on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed whoa wait, wait, what is this about why were the rest of the guys thinking this way because David had walked with God for so many years and he was governed by God enlightened principle he, he wanted to know how does God think how does God feel about this he didn't ask for other people's opinions on things in a situation like this it goes on may the Lord this is David talking to Saul now mind you he's got 3,000 soldiers may the Lord judge between you and me and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me but my hand will not touch you so David is clearing himself before the eyes of the 3,000 soldiers with Saul he's making a plea directly to Saul he's appealing to Saul's conscience if there's any left and the results are pretty amazing then when David finished saying this Saul asked is that your voice David my son and Saul did what he wept aloud oh man he's got 3,000 men with him they've been hunting for David day and night he had just killed a few weeks previously he had just killed 85 priests of the Lord because they gave one meal to David so this is a hard tough leader who doesn't want himself to look weak in the eyes of his men but he breaks he weeps because of David's words it goes on Saul's words in front of his soldiers in front of David and his men you are more righteous than I he said you have treated me well but I have treated you badly he's confessing now David you are innocent I've got all these men out hunting for you for for no appropriate reason I'm the guilty one I'm the murderous one not you he admits all this out loud completely should have lost his credibility at that point it goes on it gets even bigger Saul still talking I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands now now what happened I mean how does this guy go from being this hardened cold hearted selfishly ambitious murderer to being this this broken man who who can't seem to control from admitting his own criminality before his men and basically risking losing all credibility what happened what happened was this it's the dynamism of compassion and that's what I want us to consider next as we close out consider the dynamism of godly compassion by dynamism I mean this compassion godly compassion it releases a kind of an energy and it's a kind of an energy that can penetrate the most hardened hearts does it do that always no it does not do do we have the guarantee that if we show compassion and mercy like David did and then we confront a person with truth and love like David did truth and humility like David did do we have the assurance that that the the person that's in the wrong will, will always confess like Saul did and they'll always break down no we don't no we don't we don't have that assurance but here's the assurance we do have if we respond to a circumstance with godly compassion we can be assured we have now released the energy of God so that if that human being is reachable at all a power has now been released that can penetrate their hearts and change their character and change the course of their life the the complete trajectory of their life forever which would not happen if we didn't respond with compassion so I'm just saying that that godly compassion gives a chance a chance for a powerful redemptive victory that wouldn't be possible if we didn't respond with godly compassion let let me show you some supportive verses of this Colossians 3 this is now New Testament Colossians 3 12 it says therefore it's writing to followers of Christ therefore as God's chosen people holy and dearly loved clothe yourselves with what compassion he's saying because you're God's kids you got to look like your father and your father's full of compassion so make sure you're close do the compassionate things until you feel the compassionate feelings God will start building your character compassion based clothe yourselves with compassion and don't stop there with kindness with humility with gentleness and patience bear bear with each other which means we're going to get on each other's nerves at times bear with each other and forgive one another if any one of you has a grievance against someone forgive as the Lord forgave you I'm going to just ask you a question. How many of you 
can, maybe not easily, but you can get yourself to confess when you fail to the Lord. You, you can talk to the Lord and you can say, Lord, I'm sorry, I, I sinned, I, I messed up. How, how many of you can do that? All right. And can you also believe pretty easily, I'm not saying that you're not still struggling with some guilt, but pretty easily you can believe that he absolutely forgives you. Hands again? Okay. Now, if somebody sins against you and it really hurts you, it really brings damage on your life, is it easy for you, particularly if it's caused great damage, is it easy for you to forgive them? I, I'm actually talking to you, sir. <laughs> right there. <laughs> is that, no. no. How many agree with him? No. Okay, so you're not alone. <laughs> forgive as the Lord forgave you. But Randy, I, I can't keep being a target for somebody again and again. I'm just going to be victimized over and over and over again. No, we're not asking that. The scripture's not talking about that. It's talking about a basic relational principle between fellow followers of Christ. If you've got somebody victimizing you, that's a whole different ballgame. Come talk to me, talk, talk to Pastor Kim, Pastor Pete, somebody. But we'll, we'll try to steer you in the right direction. But this is talking about in, in basic relationships with fellow believers but but the point is this as God's kids as his family members these are the characteristics that are supposed to be easily detected in us David demonstrates this beautifully and it's powerful it might feel weak but it's powerful I, I could tell you a story from my, my life and I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going too long so I'm not going to tell you a story let me go on Romans 12 do not repay anyone evil for evil, which is my propensity. That's what I want. You do me evil. I'm, I'm, you know, my propensity is to do you evil back. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. That's what David did. David knew what was right in God's eyes, and he didn't care what anybody else thought. His conscience, his you know, God-enlightened reasoning faculties were strong enough to govern the rest of his faculties, and he brought himself under control, and he did what was right. He was principle-governed, not passion govern dear friends don't try to get even don't try to get even let God take revenge in the scriptures the Lord says I am the one to take revenge and pay them back God's justice is exact it's appropriate he knows all the factors he knows the the backgrounds of the situation he knows the motivation and he knows what it means to pay back you and you and I we don't know how to pay back we're, we're just kind of arbitrary in our responses but notice the, the tenor of all these verses. It's, it's don't, don't respond back violence with violence or, or anger with anger or whatever because if you respond with compassion, you have a chance. It's not guaranteed, but you have a chance to actually change the other person. If you respond with the same thing that they're giving you, you can guarantee it's just going to escalate and get uglier and uglier. And I'm going to show you a cycle here in just a minute about that. Let me show you one more verse from Proverbs. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them a drink. You will make them burn with, what does it say? Shame, and the Lord will reward you. Saul breaks, he burns with shame when David exposes him. He says, man, I had you, but I, I'm gonna do what's right in God's sight. I'm gonna let the Lord handle you. You know you're wrong, and now he breaks in front of all his men. When, when you and I release compassion, it feels weak, but it's dynamic. I will tell you this story. I just got to tell you this story. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I, I was a terrible little punk. I mean, I really was. Um, probably still am. Um, there was this kid in my neighborhood named Freddie Gallion. He had a paper route. And I don't even know what happened. Freddie and I got in an argument about something. I don't remember what it is. But I, I caught him in my neighborhood. He was delivering his papers. I started a conversation with him and got him real relaxed. And as soon as he relaxed, man, I hit him just as hard as I could. And blood came out of his nose. But when I hit him, it was some ice on the ground, and I slipped. Now, back in southeast Washington, where I came from, when a man slipped like that after you hit another man, you deserve to get your butt kicked good. And that's what I was waiting to happen. And so I looked up off the ground. I'm waiting for Freddie to just put it on me, and I had it coming. And this kid with his paper bag sack across his shoulder he reached down and he picked me up and he just looked at me his nose still bleeding I didn't know what to do I didn't know what to say I literally just was silent and I finally just walked away I, I felt such shame and guilt and I didn't feel much of anything in those days but I felt that so compassion and mercy are very powerful they're not weak they don't guarantee that we're going to get the result we want to see but they they, they are effective beyond what we can usually see. 
So they'll burn with shame. Saul burned with shame. He broke. Now, it didn't change his life. You got to understand. He broke for that minute. It cleared the air. Now all of his soldiers knew David was the rightful king. Saul says, you're certainly going to be king. You know, and he, and he goes on in the passage to beg David not to kill his whole family when he becomes king. It's really an amazing passage. So what if you didn't, or what if David didn't respond that way? What, what if instead of responding with compassion, he would have responded with the violence that his men wanted him to respond with? Um, how many of you guys in here, you like to cook? See your hands. In the first service, man, they were all, yeah, yeah you, that's, I like to eat. So it, it works out good that <laughs> somebody likes to cook. Okay, so you, you go online and you find this recipe you've heard about, you know, and you, you write it down the best you can, and then you cook this thing because you want to try it and see if it's as good as you've heard from other people. So you try this recipe, and you put it in your mouth, and you literally go, <laughs> you spit it back out. It tastes like dirt. I, it's not like something Howard would make. How, how, anything Howard makes, it, it's going to be really, really good. But you're like, what the world? They said this thing was good. So you look and you make sure you got the right ingredients and the best you can tell. But what you find out with more research, there was like three ingredients missing. And so before you ever serve it up to someone else, you're going you're gonna to change the recipe, right? Because if you don't change the recipe, you're going to get the same thing. So like after you spit it out, are you going to invite friends and family members over to your house to feed them that same thing you just spit out? Some of you are thinking it depends on who it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're going to change the recipe because you know if you use the same recipe, you're going to keep on getting what you got. Think about that now. Unless you change the recipe, you're going to keep on getting what you got. Let me close out with showing you this cycle. If David would have took vengeance, vengeance just breeds more vitriol, more emotion, more anger, more hatred, more poison inwardly. And it always, always leads to violence of some kind. It may not be physical violence, but there's a lot of different kinds of violence where you try to hurt someone in various ways. This cycle, it's always the same. If David would have responded that way, guaranteed Saul and his men would have fought and the violence would have escalated and David might never have become king even though he was God's choice but David didn't respond that way he responded this way with compassion and communication he walks outside the cave making himself vulnerable and he says Saul hey 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 we got to talk about this you didn't know I was in there but I had you God put you in my hands I, I could have killed you you've been telling your men that I'm out to assassinate you and here's the, the proof I'm no assassin you know better I never have been so he communicates he speaks the truth in love which is what the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 tells us to do as Christ followers and it ends with contrition what does Jesus say? If you have an issue between somebody, he says, go to them privately and talk to the person about the issue. If they'll listen to you, you you've won your brother or won your sister. If that doesn't work, get one or two others, take them, have the conversation again. The goal of the conversation is reunion, reconciliation. Contrition is the pathway to that. Saul breaks and it changes the whole situation. So here it is. We either go with tat for tat, which just escalates more and more or we choose compassion now you can't choose and I can't choose compassion unless I've built a sufficient godly character and, and you might be thinking well you know I'm not there yet Randy well none of us are there until we start developing we start growing we start filling ourselves with God's will and his word we start you know immersing ourselves with God's people and and we have people speak love into our lives and and all these dynamics start happening until we start growing and the things we couldn't do before now we can do because our god enlightened reasoning faculties and our conscience are growing strong and they can they can bring under control those dark impulses and passions and feelings and desires for selfishness that we might have so what if today was your day and we'll all have them where it's pivotal we're the windshield all the power is in our hands we can we can do good to someone or we can do plenty of harm to them we can drive that dagger in deep if we want or we can turn to them and give them compassion they don't deserve what are we capable of doing right now where we're at is our character capable of doing what david did L not listening to even his friends they were saying yeah you you should do this you should wipe him out but say no no, no i'm I hear the voice of God. I hear that whisper of God in my conscience and I'm listening to that against all odds. 
because I know that voice. <laughs> that voice has never, ever misled me, but my impulses certainly have. And so I'm, I'm going to build that godly character so that I'll have the capacity to manifest compassion at the pivotal moment when the person, you've got to hear this, they deserve it least, I want to give it least, but I know it's the right thing to do. Good. And I've got the, the power of God molded, shaped character that I actually can do it. I actually can do it at the pivotal moment. I hope, if nothing else, it's made all of us in here recognize that there, there's greater capacities for self-control than what we ever imagined, and that the power of God works often in what feels to us, looks to us like complete weakness. Compassion doesn't look very strong. Forgiveness doesn't look very strong. But it can. It can penetrate the hardest heart. It doesn't always, but it can. Let's pray. Father, you, you know each of us, and you know whether or not we're at a pivotal moment in our life where we have a choice that could deeply affect somebody else's life. You know if we're at that situation where we have the opportunity to manifest compassion to someone that does not deserve it, that your spirit might be free to at least attempt to do a deep work in their heart. May you stir our hearts that we seek your face, that we'll build that character to your honor and give the compassion that so shows the heart of you, the living God. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.